Hey folks, Mel the Train Tutor back in the studio and back with another tips video for you. And in this tips video, we're back in the back to basics playlist because we're looking at core skills and we're looking at spray cans. Yes, uh, our primers that we use. It came up on a live show, uh, various tips and that sort of stuff. And I did a few and there was much of a request for a video on it. So here we are. Right. Sprays, they are a great terrain tool. They're quick, they're easy, they're fast. And if you don't have an airbrush, they're a great way of getting some effects, uh, terrain effects that you normally need an airbrush for, but you can shotgun them with these. Now, before we dig in, couple of safety points, bit of information about the paint. First off, they are harmful, okay? Uh, the spraying that I'm gonna do in this video, I'm gonna be doing it outside and I'll talk over the top of the, those bits. When you're spraying, always make sure that you have a mask, always make sure you're working in a well-ventilated area. Either you use an extraction booth or you take it outside, okay? Do not spray in an enclosed area. It's not good for you guys. Now, when it comes to spray paints themselves, you get two types. You get acrylic and enamels. Now, what you want is you want to concentrate on the acrylics. In my entire terrain life, I've never used enamel paint for anything terrain wise, so stick with your acrylics, okay? And whatever you do, don't cross the paints, they do not mix well. So, acrylic spray cans. Well, let's look at it. We've got a couple here, and let me take you through. Okay, well, we've got a couple and a few extra little ones. Now, first off with the acrylics, yeah, we have the Halford spray primers, okay? Halfords are a really good brand. They're quite cheap. I think I pay about six quid for these cans. Uh, really, really good primers. Uh, because they're automotive, they're designed to a very high end. Now, quick little tip for you on the Halfords Grey. Halfords Grey is what's called a neutral grey or an 18% grey, so I'm told. And for you YouTubers, this is actually the perfect colour for your colour balance cards. So, not only does it have a use with terrain making, it's also got a use with us YouTubers. So, we've got the Halfords ones there. Next ones, I've got these flame ones, okay? Now, these flame ones, uh, they're from a gift gaff in the UK. These are, uh, these are graffiti artist cans, so they're top end paints. They're actually relatively, I think they're actually cheaper than the Halfords ones to be perfectly honest, but they're great. But what I really like about the flame ones is, as you can see, the range of colours they come in is really good, okay? I've got all sorts of tans and browns and that sort of stuff, and they're great for getting a quick earth coating on something, like Kerry's little, uh, what you call it, badger diorama. Now, moving on from the flame cans, another common cans that I use are Army Painter. Okay, now, Army Painter acrylic primers, Really good. Now the benefit for terrain making with using Army Painter is the fact that they match the colours with their acrylic paints. When you're spraying up terrain, quite often, you know, graffiti artists and other people who are spraying spray on flat surfaces. When we're, we're spraying terrain, what will often happen is as we're spraying, yeah, there will be gribbly bits on the terrain that stick out and the spray won't go behind those and you'll get missing patches. What I really like about the Army Painter ones is because they're colour matched, you can get the, uh, the standard acrylic colour somewhere down there and then just brush on and watch or, or airbrush on and just fill in those gaps, yeah? So if you're looking for a good base coat for your MDF cuts, stuff like that in your kit, you can pre-colour them with what's your Army Painter and then if you miss any bits, go in and touch them up. So Army Painter, coloured paints, really good for that application. Okay, now moving on, yeah, we have a couple other cans here. Now, we've got Plasticoat, okay? Now, Plasticoat is a B&M primer. If you, if, watch, if you treat it well, you'll get good results from it, but it can be a little bit temperamental at times, I've found. So, you need to be careful with this stuff. Always watch, you do a test spray, and that applies to all your sprays, yeah? Before you prime something and do something, Test it first to make sure it's not a dodgy can, especially if it's new or it's been sitting on a shelf in a while. Especially with these, I've had problems with these, but if you follow the guidelines I'm gonna show you in this video, you shouldn't have any problems because generally if I follow the guidelines, 
they work out all right. Now, a couple of other ones that I very quickly want to talk about. You've got things like these, which is the Rust-Oleums. Yeah, Rust-Oleum, another brilliant can make, yeah? But they do texture spray paints. Texture spray paints are great for getting a rough texture down on things. They can really sort of hype up, uh, it's a great way. I've used them actually when you're doing hills and you don't want to bother putting grit and stuff down on the top. To just spray this stuff as a quick texturing where I want my grit sort of thing and then leave the rock faces where they are. So, handy little thing to have in your arsenal, okay? But not essential obviously. Then the final spray I want to talk about is, what you call it? Uh, Spray varnish. Now, a lot of people have frostings with this. I have a solution for you. Uh, I'll explain at the end of the video, but when it comes to spray varnishes, I always go for car lacquers, yeah? Just simply because they've been designed to a much superior, higher level than what you call it, than most of the hobby ones. <coughs> Pardon me, still getting over a cold. They're, what you call it, they're much better. What I find is with the hobby ones, unless you have everything perfect, you have problems with frosting and that sort of stuff. Now, I'm going to talk about frosting at the end of the video, but very quickly, if you use automotive spray cans, they are far more, I won't say durable, but they're designed to get around a lot of the problems the hobby ones don't. That You can use them in far better envi or far worse environments than the hobby ones. I'll explain that more near the end of the video. Right, give me a second and we'll quickly talk about can mechanics. So before we jump into the techniques, a quick chat about can mechanics. Yeah, and what do I mean by can mechanics? Well, as always with these videos, I think that if you understand what you're using, yeah, you can use it better. So let me explain what's actually in, in here. What you've got in here is, you've got propellant and paint, basically. There's a couple of extra things and a widget for shaking, but there's propellant and paint. Now the propellant, okay, is a liquid gas, and its job is to propel the paint out of the can when you spray it. Now the propellant is the heavy stuff and the paint pigment sits at the top. Now in its liquid form, it doesn't spray that well. It needs to be shaken up and warmed up and I'll take you through that in a minute. But basically what happens is, when you depress the trigger, you release the gas out, yeah? You release the, the pressure. The, the propellant in it forces the paint up the tube and out and sprays it, okay? Now, this is quite important because the fact that the propellant is, sorry, the propellant, the, the paint is heavier, the propellant is lighter. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the paint is heavier, the propellant is lighter. So the propellant is up here, you press the button, the paint's down here, it gets squirted. As the propellant pushes down, forces the paint up the tube and out the top. <laughs> Got that right. <laughs> now, when you're using these cans, okay, there's a couple of things, you don't use them straight off the shelf, okay? You've got to prepare them. Now, preparing them is quite simple. First off, the colder the can is, the less the, you get more pressure from the propellant, the warmer the can is, okay? So you'll get a better spray if the can is warm. If you just take it off your shelf or out of the garage or out of somewhere cold and try and use it wet, you'll get lots of splatters. Now the other thing is, the paint's quite thick in it, okay? And so it needs stirring up and so it needs shaking as well. And if you do shake it, you should start to hear that. Now you can hear it in two different tones. What you've got to do is keep going until you can hear it in just one tone. It could take up to two minutes, but it's getting there. And once you've got it totally shaken up, yeah, it'll be ready to spray. Now let me show you this. I'm going to nip outside and I'm going to talk over this video so you can see the effects of warming your cans and spraying them. Now when it comes to warming them up, you want to put them in some, some water that's warm but not too hot. So, it's got to be bearable for your hand, yeah? And without doing that thing where, yeah, 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 that's okay, yeah, 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 no. Yeah, if you can comfortably put your hand in there, you can put this in there. If it's too hot for your hand, it's too hot for your cans. And that's important because if these things get too hot, they explode, okay? So, hand warmth only, yeah? And they'll be fine in that. Any hotter, you're risking something. Right, I'll head outside. 
and show you what I mean. So first off, let's start with a can that's cold and what you call it, hasn't been shaken. So if I bring it up and give it a bit of a spray, you'll notice it's really quite thick and wet and very splodgy. Okay, that's because the propellant hasn't been shaken up, the paint hasn't been shaken up, the can's cold. So if we give the can a bit of a shake, and now when we use it, what you can see is we're getting a much finer spray, far less bobbles, but it is still reasonably thick because the can's cold. Now, if we take a can out of our warm water and quickly give it a quick dry off, and then you can see it's going down much, much finer because that's, the propellant is nice and warm. We're getting a really good spray out of it. And now, if we shake it up as well, we get really good spray effects. So above all, warm your cans and, and shake them well, guys. And so if we look at the results of our spraying, yeah, let me bring this up. There you go. Now, starting off, we started on that side. That side was the uh, coal can unshaken. And you can see splatter marks all around it, really heavy splatter marks. Once we shaked it up, shook it up, yeah, we started to get better results. But if you compare it straight away to down below, just the unshaken one, we've got some brilliant results there, okay? And then if you take it over and do the warmth, even better, yeah? So above all, when you're using these cans, the best thing to do is make sure you warm them up and shake them well for the best results. Okay, it avoids all that splattering, it avo avoids the heavy coating, you get far even coverage, far more misting. So, warm it and shake it, guys. Now, after you've used it, it's time to watch it to sort of, once you've finished using it, yeah, you've got to look after them. And the second stage of this is to make sure your nozzles are clean. So, stepping back outside again to show you this one. So to clean your propellant, normally the propellant sits at the top with the paint at the bottom. If you turn your can upside down, give it a squeeze, the propellant is, what you call it, is at the top now, and as the gap will force itself out, clearing paint from the no nozzle. You should always do that at the end of using cans, otherwise you're going to leave paint inside the nozzle and inside your tube. That's going to dry and then it's not going to work. So remember, every time you use a can when you finish using it, just turn it upside, press the button until it goes clear and then it's all cleaned and ready for use. So we've talked about preparing our cans and we've talked about cleaning up afterwards, but we should actually talk about the proper use of cans. Now for this we're going to have to nip outside again, so off we go. Now when it comes to laying down spray paint, most people just blast it and just constantly shake it all over the place trying to give a good solid coating. And that's actually the wrong way to do it. You see, if you do that, what you create is you create lots of paint in one area before it's had time to dry. So you keep piling it on, you keep piling it on, and you get gloop spots and thick areas. What you should do is start and just pass over the piece, going from one side to the other, and not change direction back again until you're off it. This stops hot spots being created, and it gives the, the paint you're putting down a chance to dry before you layer the next layer on top of it. When you're laying it down it dries really quickly or the majority of the propellant dries off really quickly but if you lay it on too thick in one spot it will get thick and it will run. So simple layers backwards and forwards will sort that. So above all, when you're applying your paint, remember, long longitudinal strokes. Don't change direction on the piece or you'll get a hot spot. You could get runs, you'll get thick coatings of paint. What you actually want is just nice, even strokes backwards and forwards, and that will give you a perfect finish. So guys, that's pretty much all the basics of using the cans, from how to prepare them, how to use them, and then the cleaning technique at the end to stop block nozzles. So now what we need to do is talk a little bit about terrain. 
Now, obviously we can use this as a primer as terrain, of terrain, and I've already talked about Army Painter and the idea of using those to colour match. And if you're doing MDF kits, it's great because you can pre-paint them and paint the sections before you actually assemble the kit, and it just makes the job so much easier. But beyond getting a solid coating down, what can you do with these? Well, graffiti artists and, and spray can artists can do all sorts of the, things with these, but there's a couple of techniques that are specific to terrain making. Now, the first one is dusting, and it's a technique that I use regularly, okay? And when I'm dusting, what you call it, I'll often use it for snow and, and that sort of stuff, and I recently used it on the High Peak Pass jobby. I mean, here's a before and after pick. Now that was just, okay, a dusting. And I wanna show you how I do my dustings, okay? So, let's nip outside and I'll talk you through the technique. Now when we normally use cans, we place our finger on the trigger and we depress it firmly. But what this results in is a very strong flow, which isn't right for dusting. So, put your finger at the very back of the trigger and just gently press that. That produces a much finer effect, okay? One thing you do have to be careful about is dripping with dusting. As you spray, you'll get drips building up on the end of the nozzle. So every so often, what you need to do is come along with a little bit of tissue, okay, and just clean the nozzle off, yeah? The reason being is if you get paint buildup in between as you're spraying, if there's a blob on the end of the nozzle, when you next press to spray, it won't send a fine mist, it will catapult that blob as a splat towards your piece. So when you're pressing the trigger lightly and you're taking breaks and little blasts, always keep an eye on your nozzle, always keep it clean for the best dusting effects. And that's the basic principle of dusting. The idea of holding the can away from the piece quite far, using the back of the trigger and just doing little taps and watching your nozzle for that splat build up, that little drop, because that's a real pain in the backside to be truthful. Catches me out quite a bit to be perfectly honest, but I'm getting better at it and I'm sure you will too with practice. So that's dusting. Now dusting is great for laying like that look of snow dusting over things when you're doing snow work, but I've also used it for burning and damage effects and it works quite well. So with dusting out of the way, what else can we do with spray primers? Well, with spray primers, remember, they're, they're designed to go down before you put other paint on. So there is a technique called zenith highlighting that you can do with spray primers, which is a, a pre-shading technique, okay? And it's designed or it's used to be able to get more realistic colours on your model easier. Okay, so let's nip outside and I'll take you through that. Now the principle behind Zenith Highlighting is the idea that things are darker at the bottom and lighter at the top. So we start with a dark coat and we come from underneath and we catch underneath everything. This creates our shadows, okay? Go round it, spot, and make sure you've got a nice light coating of black all the way around the bottom and catch any overhangs underneath them, okay? Once the, the black's dry, you can go in with a grey and sort of come in from sort of a 45 degree angle down. This will start to highlight it. It will only rest on the higher areas, leaving the black underneath it, and it will start to create natural shade. A final quick dusting of white, right from ver pretty much vertical, will give the final highlight for you. Be very careful with this, go light, and just aim for the very tops, otherwise you can ruin the effect. Now, once all that's done, you've got your piece, okay, and then you can just apply a layer of paint over it, and standard acrylic paint. And because the primers are different, going from lighter to darker, that paint will also change color with that, as primers do change the color of paint and immediately you'll get a shaded building. So if you've got a lot of MDF kits to do, a lot of buildings to do quick, Zenith highlighting is a really good way of getting a lot of shading, then just being able to go in with your base coats and they will appear 
like they're properly shaded and then just go in with a wash just to blend it all in and it works an absolute treat. Now one quick word on Zenith highlighting or more importantly the paints you use. Always use the same brand paint. Okay, I'm not even talking about don't use acrylic and enamel in the same. Don't use different brand, brands paints. So don't use a grey from Halfords and a white from Army Painter. You'll have problems. Even though they are both acrylic spray cans, the chemicals that are designed in them, the propellants, that sort of stuff, they can react with each other with different brands. So if you're gonna do Zenith highlighting, make sure that your black, your gray, and your white are all from the same manufacturer and all from the same range because they will essentially be just be different pigments with the same chemical mixes for the propellants and all that sort of stuff that goes in them. Yeah, so don't mix your brands when you're doing Zenith highlighting. Or to be truthful, you shouldn't really mix your brands when you're priming anything, to be perfectly honest. So just bear that in mind, especially if you're going colored primers to gray with your MDF kits and you're doing the pre-paint thing. Now, uh, let me think what I've got to tell you about next. Took a little time for the old grey mat to kick in, but the last thing I wanted to talk about was spray varnish and that frosting issue. But before I do, one quick mention that I should actually talk about. These are chemical paints and that sort of stuff. They're not exactly the same as acrylics because of the... The, the carrier and the paints that are in them. And what I mean is, when you put acrylic paint down, once it's dry, it's dry, okay? When you're working with spray cans, there's a difference, there's a difference. And the difference is dry and cured, okay? Now, you can spray something with a spray primer and it will dry and you can paint on top of it. But that spray primer won't be cured. Now, spray primers can take anywhere between two days and seven days to, to actually cure, depending on the environment they're in, how dry it is, wind flow and all that sort of humidity and all that sort of stuff. But basically, just because you've sprayed it and it it's touch dry, doesn't mean the chemical process is finished. It's still curing, which means it's still giving off gas. That's why quite often when you prime stuff, okay, and it's dry, it still smells because the primer is still degassing, it's still curing, it's still giving off gas. Now, in the majority of times when doing terrain and that sort of stuff, because of the length of time it takes to actually paint it all up, that's not a problem. Okay, also with miniatures, it, because of the, the actual amount of paint you put down when you're doing a miniature, it's not really a problem. But you need to keep it in mind as one of those pieces of knowledge in the back of your head. And the reason being is that when it comes to putting a varnish on it, you're sealing it. Now, if that primer hasn't fully cured and stopped smelling by the time you put the, the what you call it, the primer on it, uh, sorry, the, the gloss on it, the, the varnish, the sealer. There's a chance that the gas will get trapped and you'll get crackling, you'll get frosting and you'll get all sorts of weird issues that you weren't expecting. So quick tip, if you can smell primer, don't seal it. Now, like I say, in the majority of cases with terrain and with models, it's not so much of a problem, but it is think, something to be aware that if you can smell it, don't seal it. Okay, once you can't smell it, it's ready to be sealed. Another quick pointer on this, <coughs> oh, pardon me, is what you call it, is this idea that, sorry, is the idea that if you use these things to do ground coverings or the base coats of water effects, remember putting resin on, yeah, your water effects, or putting on an acrylic, what you call it, an acrylic water effect, you know, still water or something like that, you're gonna have the same problems as sealing it. If you can smell it, then there's still gas going off. And what that will mean is if you put your resin on top of it, the gas will come up, okay, and it will get trapped and you will get bubbles and all sorts of weird stuff going on in your resin. So with your resin and sealing, if you smell it, wait until you can't smell it, then move on. Now for the final one when it comes to sealing, as I said, I use car varnish because Car lacquer, it's just designed to be a better lacquer because it's going on something that's typically worth anywhere between 15 and 50 grand, okay? 
Whereas your hobby lacquer is going on something that's probably worth somewhere between 15 pence and at most 50 quid. <laughs> yeah, unless you're buying a Titan. But you know what I mean? The, the, the scale of the risk, basically, yeah, the people who make this make damn sure that it's right because if it doesn't go right, the bill to correct it is absolutely huge. Whereas the people who make these and no discounts to Army Paint or anyone like that, yeah, the risk isn't so great if it goes wrong. I mean, if you spray your BMW, which you've just spent, you know, two grand fixing a paint job and, and the spray crackles or does something wrong, that's an expensive complaint. You know what I mean? So they make sure this stuff is good, it's mixed right, and also because it needs to be right, it's got a lot more play. Yeah, it's a lot more, I don't know what the word is, it's on the tip of my tongue, but it's a lot less temperamental than these, although I'm not saying these are temperamental, but you understand what I mean? Now, one of the biggest problems people have when they are spraying, and it's not so much terrain, to be perfectly honest, it's normally their, their models, but it does happen with terrain, is frosting. Now, frosting comes from two reasons. One, your primer hasn't cured and it's still degassing. And as it degasses, yeah, in the liquid sealant, that gas gets trapped and it goes all misty, okay? So, that's the smell it. If you can smell it, don't seal it thing. The other side is actually the environment and it's actually the moisture in the air. If you're in a particularly damp environment, cold, damp environment, then there's actually moisture particles in the air. You can't see them, you just, you can't even feel them, but they're there, okay? And as you spray your spray lacquer, what happens is it comes down and it traps those moisture particles in the spray, sticks them to your model, and you end up with moisture. And that's where the frosting comes from. Yeah, and so the only way to get around that sort of frosting is to make sure you, you're spraying in a really dry environment, you know, where there's no moisture in the air. Now you may turn around and say, yeah, but you've just told me I've got to do it in a well-ventilated area. Uh, I haven't got a spray booth. The wife is going to kill me if I do it in the kitchen, even though it's nice and warm in there. What do I do, Bosicle? Manufacture warmth. Okay, quick tip for you. And I've got this one off Mike. Mike is a mate of mine who's a pro painter. He's had work in all sorts of rule books. Warlords rule books, Games Workshop rule books. And he's, he's an experimental painter. He figures things out. And he came up with this, so credit to Mike C for this. Yeah, but basically, as you're spraying, if you get a heat gun or a hairdryer, yeah, and you hold it over the top, Start the heat gun before you spray, okay? That will, that will produce a, a, a stream of warm air and it will dry the moisture particles out of the way. So as you spray, okay, what you get is you get no moisture getting trapped in the, in the spray and it seals it perfectly. And one of the best ways of doing this is actually to get a cardboard box so that the hot air goes in to the cardboard box bounces round it and comes out. So you've got your cardboard box and you've got the open end facing you. Okay, so you've got the, the other one, the other side's full there. Miniature or model in the, in the middle, heat gun, spray, 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 spray. Yeah, you'll have no frosting problems whatsoever. I've been doing it for donkey's ages. I can pretty much do it in the rain. Yeah, with this technique. As long as it isn't too heavy, yeah, I can even varnish as it's, you know, a little bit of drizzle, no problem. Yeah, just get up close. Obviously, it's better if you're not actually standing in the rain, but yeah, that's the technique. Just remo remove the moisture from the air, either by spraying in somewhere that's warm or by artificially creating warmth with a heat gun or a hairdryer. Obviously, if you're using a heat gun, yeah, keep it moving a bit so you don't hot spot and melt your model or take the paint off, yeah? So guys, uh, there's quite a bit of other stuff when it comes to spray cans and doing things like artistic techniques, but they're not really applicable to terrain. You can get these things, you can get different caps to give, to give you different sprays, different pressure sprays and all that sort of stuff. Never needed to use them, guys. I've tried them. They don't make that much of a difference. With regards to control, we're quite good with, you know, just moving our finger from you know, the full pressure to tap it at the back of it for our, our sort of control, pressure control. It works fine. But above all, to get the best results out of these, warm them up, shake them well, 
clean off any drips, make sure you clear them out afterwards. And if you're frosting or anything like that, be aware of cure times for the primers, be aware of the environment you're spraying in. And then beyond that, you've got a couple of techniques. You've got the dusting technique, dead easy, quick, beautiful results. Yeah, and the Zenith Highline technique for really knocking terrain out really quick. Remember, the Zenith Highline works on models as well. I just use an airbrush on models. It's a bit shotgunny with these on models. Yeah, you can rank them up and, and sort of do them as a squad, but then bits get missed. So airbrushing is better than spray cans for models. But for terrain, spray cans are brilliant. So that's it, guys. Uh, I'm quite curious, because I know you guys are quite knowledgeable folks. What's your favorite spray can tip? Get it down in the comments for me and see if we can make this a bit of a resource. And for anyone reaching this point in the video, head down into the comments and go have a look what other tips. That's what I'll be doing when this video goes up. Always interested in learning, just like you guys. And as always, guys, if you do have any questions about any of this, get those down in the comments as well. Like it, share it as always. And if you really do appreciate these videos and the helping you with your hobby, please consider supporting the channel and helping me. There's a link down below to Patreon. All I ask is $1 a month, just $1. You can't even buy a pint of coffee or a pork pie with any of that, but you can keep me in here with these lights on, these cameras rolling and me helping you with your hobby and I rely on you good folks who make it to the end of these videos to make all this happen and if you're not into just a dollar a month on a regular basis and you'd like to send just a one-off there is a link to PayPal down below you can send a one-off or there's also the Amazon wish list you get something for the studio it all helps me help you with your hobby guys and in the meantime I'm gonna love you and leave you because I've got a bit more spraying to do and I've got other things to crack on with so I'll see you soon guys all the best. Ta-da.